Hello, friends, and welcome to Conversations with Consequences. We are the radio show and podcast of the Catholic Association, where we aim to change the culture one conversation at a time. You can listen to Conversations with Consequences on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network, Saturday mornings at 7 a.m. Eastern, or catch the Encore at 5 p.m. We are also on Sirius XM Channel 130. Of course, our radio show is always a podcast. Go to thecatholicassociation.org slash podcasts or directly to wherever you listen to your podcasts. I'm your hostess, Dr. Gracie Christie, and as always, I'm so thankful for our listeners and the fact that you keep showing up week after week. I hope that we can give you a show this week again on Conversations with Consequences. This week, we will be having an interview with Alejandro Monteverde um, on the movie Cabrini that will be in the theaters this week, this weekend, actually, and I highly recommend that I was able to see the screening, um, the screener that was sent to me to review it and it it's absolutely wonderful. I also will be reading to you a Lenten reflection that I published in The Catholic Thing, and uh, it's about one of my favorites, one of the sermons of St. John Henry Newman on the mental sufferings of Christ. It affected me very much, and I hope that I'm able to express that in my Lenten reflection. But first, we are so happy to have David Baird to discuss popcorn with the Pope. The Oscars are also this weekend, so we take the opportunity to go through the Vatican's film list put together by Pope St. John Paul II in 1995. The Word on Fire has put together a, uh, a whole book in which each of these movies has an essay written about it, a review with a film by a film critic who has analyzed each movie, offering some great insights into why these films should be watched. Some of the movies include On the Waterfront, The Wizard of Oz, Babette's Feast, It's a Wonderful Life, A Man for All Seasons, and so many more. Welcome to the show, David. Great. Thanks to be here. David, you're the main author on a new book out from Word on Fire called Popcorn with the Pope. Tell us about this book and why should we all be rushing to buy it? <laughs> well, this uh, the book is a review of these 45 films that the Vatican recommended back in 1995. One of the maybe exciting things about the book is that it alerts us that this list exists. <laughs> so many people have never heard of this list or that the Vatican has ever had a kind of positive, encouraging view on popular culture and generally movies specifically. Uh, so this is an introduction to those films, and it's a pretty interesting list. Uh, David, I, I recently wrote an article about um, going back to watching the classics with your kids because I found it kind of counterintuitive that um, my kids actually – you know, my kids are younger. Um, the oldest is 11. I have five kids. And so with the three older ones who are six, nine and 11, we try to watch a movie every week with them or do a family movie night. We don't always make it through the whole movie, but um, we were kind of quickly running out of material um, because there's just so much trash out there. Mm -hmm. And so we started going back to the old classics. And um, one of the first ones that we picked was Ben Hur. And I was sort of unsure because I that if they can't sit still for, you know, a one hour or, you know, two hour movie, how are they going to, you know, sit through a movie from the 1950s that's four hours long? And they <laughs> were wrapped. And they've been asking ever since, when can we watch Ben-Hur again? When can we watch Ben-Hur again? And mm. so this article that I wrote went bananas. And it shows that I think, you know, there's a real... Um, are re people are desperate for for content that's that's quality that's um that's family friendly and so uh, i'm thrilled to see your list i texted it to my husband and so now we've got years worth of movies to go to <laughs> um but what was the you know what inspired you to um to actually sit down and and take this list that's been around for 20 years more than 20 almost 20 years now and actually turn it into a, a book Hmm. Yeah. So incidentally, Ben Hur is on the is on this list. <laughs> so that was a good choice. Yeah, I saw um, that. <laughs> uh, so um, I wrote a film review column for several years, and it was funny that right about this time of the year, maybe the beginning of the summer, I noticed this tendency to one of my co columnists and I would tend to start like dipping into the archives. <laughs> That's because I think it would uh, 
maybe it's like the summer is like notoriously slow for like high quality cinematic fare. But I think this is maybe indicative of the larger situation we find ourselves in that you're describing it kind of ironically uh, in this age of like proliferating options, so many movies out there and coming out every year, but then it's seeming that they're, are so few that really are satisfying to watch. So like you suggested, uh, I think there is a growing desire for um, a a guide maybe to, or just a desire to go back and uh, comb the the archives for for really great material, but it can be overwhelming. So that's where maybe we need uh, sometimes a, a guide. Uh, this list specifically, I was introduced to by one of my good friends in graduate school and a uh, Polish guy with a great Polish last name, uh, and he uh, told me about this list and my reaction uh, when I heard about it was, oh, I didn't even know there was such a list. <laughs> and this became the, the refrain uh, as I started watching the films and would uh, tell other people about it, you know, academics, people who are really working at the intersection of film and theology. Uh, and basically everyone I ever mentioned this list to said, oh, I've never heard of that. <laughs> so as uh, this reaction, these reactions uh, piled up, I thought, you know, maybe more people would like to know about this list and a book might be a good way to do that. David, sometimes when when we look out uh, along on the filmscape and the move and the the landscape of all the different offerings, as you say, which are so so over the top, right? You can you can sit down and stream thousands thousands of of all sorts mm-hmm. of stuff um, done now done before. But what makes what makes something worthy of being on a list like this? Because it's not about content necessarily being clean or manageable or decent or something you can watch with your kids. Because there's movies on on this list that you wouldn't want to watch with young children because the themes are mature. So what mm. is it about these uh, these films that make them worthy to be on this list in, in a big in a, sort of in a, on the big in the big picture? Mm. It's a great question. So we have the list, but we don't have a detailed reflection on why these films were chosen. There's uh, some hints in the organization of the list, which is divided into three. The first category being religion second values and the third art which really interestingly suggests that we can approach films and appreciate them from a variety of perspectives but kind of speculating maybe like why were these films chosen or you know what makes a film worth watching uh from a theological perspective i'd say maybe two big criteria this is just me riffing uh right now but one i would think that a really good film will have something good to say it'll have a perspective on life big questions human predicament um and then secondly will convey this perspective in a really compelling way mm-hmm. i think a lot of the films that we see coming out today are masterfully uh crafted like really compelling stories but often fall down <laughs> on the, the first criterion of having something worth, worthy of saying or, you know, perspective that enriches us as viewers. And also sometimes, um, or maybe almost all the time, the fair that's out there now in general is, um, it glorifies uh, parts of, of our natures, which sh- should not be glorified, frankly, right? Mm. Or, uh, I mean, it happens to me very often, not right now because I gave it up for Lent, but it happens to me very often <laughs> that I'll <laughs> I'll put something on, on, on a streaming channel just to, to entertain me while I blow dry my hair or I do my nails. And, and I have to turn it off because it, it makes me feel gross inside. Just the, and I'm not even talking about nasty things. I don't watch things that have, um, you know, egregious things in it. But just like a sort of a general feeling of hopelessness and despair or, mm. or that everything's wrong and there aren't any heroes and human virtue doesn't even exist. That's the feeling I get from so much modern fare. And, and, and it's what I imagine is, in, is not present in these films that the Vatican recommends. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, a lot of these movies on this list, they deal with difficult, harrowing topics. Like, I don't know, roughly a third of the movies are dealing with either directly or the fallout of the world wars. So, you know, big, tough complicated uh, human things from history. Uh, 
Uh, but as you suggest, uh, these films, I think the way that they approach them, the out of frame, as it were, the way that there's, uh, is, is moral or, you know, consistent with, um, the way that I think, uh, Christianity would have us uh, view the world. So I think, I think you're, you're dead on to, to diagnose that so many of the, the things that we could just casually stumble across in our Netflix scrolling these days uh, deal with these difficult topics, but not in a way that's like ultimately edifying, helpful. Mm-hmm. So I don't think that we really need to shrink from difficult things um, from cinema, but it really does matter like how they're portrayed. David, I've had a chance to <clears throat> look through the entire list, um, but for our listeners who haven't, um, is the list, I mean, I noticed a lot, you know, that the list is heavily Christian, which makes sense. It's the Vatican's list of movies, and there's movies mm-hmm. like A Man for All Seasons, which is about Thomas More, and um, and the movie about St. Joan of Arc. Um, but are any of the movies not um, explicitly Christian films? And, you know, if 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 somebody who is not a Christian but was just looking for, um, you know, something and, and, and wasn't interested in a movie about, let's say, a saint, um, mm. Are there are there titles on there that you you know you could recommend to a more secular audience? Mm. And what per, yeah. and what percent what percent of the list is not sort of an explicitly Christian you know in in nature? Sixty six point six percent. So two two thirds of the films on the on the list are not what I would say. Uh, explicitly Christian. So the first category, religion, those are all more or less that way. But it's one of the really interesting and I think kind of maybe courageous, if you can put it that way, uh, aspects of the list. Uh, yeah, two thirds of the films um, aren't, you know, directly about Jesus or Joan of Arc or anyone, you know, about like a dock worker struggling uh, to be a moral person. Uh, in the 1950s, so that would be like on the waterfront, great Marlon Brando movie, or even Gandhi is one of the uh, films on the list. A very moral man who was not a Christian had a respect for Jesus and Christianity, uh, but was not himself a Christian. So I think it's it's one of the really beautiful features of the the selection of these films. Uh, they find goodness and beauty uh, in places um, where Christianity isn't really even a subtext. And just a follow up question to that, you know, wh- what do you think are some of the surprises or like the, you know, I wouldn't have thought that would be on there, um, if if any. And and if you found them kind of surprising, you know, why do you think they wound up on there? Hmm. So the list came out. Uh, in 1995, which was the 100th anniversary of the first public screening of film. So in some ways, the list, I think, is meant to serve as a retrospective and an appreciation of the history of cinema. And again, we don't really know exactly why each film was chosen, but my guess is that some of them were chosen to be like representative of a certain subfield or genre in cinema. Uh, so, for example, we have a Western on there, John Ford movie Stagecoach. We have 2001 Space Odyssey, which is a science fiction movie, another uh, old-timey silent film, one of the first science fiction movies, Metropolis. We've got a early horror movie on there, Nosferatu. So it's pretty wide-ranging, uh, these selections. And some of them you think, well, why Stagecoach and not a different John Ford Western? Um, or... Uh, why Little Women and not a different uh, 19th century novel. Um, but I, I think that uh, these films might be surprising that they're that specifically, but maybe not so surprising if part of the goal is to introduce us readers of the list to a kind of sweeping, wide-ranging appreciation of art, uh, of cinema as an art form. I feel like the... the this book, the list, but also the book and the fact that there's an essay for each of the 45 movies on the list mm. is a way of introducing people who, who may think of movie watching and show watching as a kind of uh, an inconsequential 
pastime, right? Mm. Like you watch it and entertains you. It gets you through your through the time that it takes you to do your nails. If you're like me, <laughs> which <laughs> bores me horribly. Um, <laughs> But the truth is that movies are, they can, they have, they're, they can be a bearer of, of spiritual and moral messages. Like movies can be things that, that inspire us and, and fill us with, with ideas about the world around us and how, and how the world ought to be, right? Or how we could be better people in the world that we live in, watching other people's lives and how they interact with their world. One of the, one of the movies, on the list that had a huge impact on me was Babette's Feast, which is mm. a movie from 1987. And it's about an elderly woman, no, two elderly sisters in, in Denmark, I think. And they receive a, a, a Parisian widow. She's a refugee, I think a Catholic refugee. And mm. she cooks for them. And they're like Puritans, I think, and they're not they are not comfortable with all her ostentatious <laughs> culinary skill. But yeah. it, I don't know much about... Babette's feast and what really the movie, the movie, the the director was trying to express and the and the the script writer, but it felt to me like it was an explanation of the Eucharist, right? The kind of over, the lavish feeding uh, that Jesus does for us that on the altar, how he overfeeds us and how he wants us to 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 be satisfied and overly satisfied and enriched and it's almost decadent, right? What Jesus does for us, mm. and well that's the kind of thing that. If you if you're not looking at movies, um, if you're not looking at, at movies as bearers of truth, you may miss completely. And maybe I'm wrong about Babette's feast. Maybe I made that up entirely. <laughs> oh no, I think you're not alone in that. Uh, in the way you're reading this film, there. <laughs> what do you think about that? About introducing people to to movies as be- bearers of truth? Oh, it's a great point. I <laughs> my sense is that a lot of us, without really realizing it, have grown up in our cinematic. Uh, lives basically doing the equivalent of like always eating at McDonald's. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, we're, we're really just used to something that's fast and easy and has like instant gratification. Maybe it makes us feel a little gross afterwards, but you know, that's just part of the, what you do when you go to McDonald's or, you know, sit down and watch a movie. Whereas there's this whole other universe of uh, movies, a, a grand cinema state of really nourishing, delicious, cinematic fare. Uh, And I think one of the great uh, things that this book can do is just introduce people to a small sampling of that, the possibilities. Uh, So I think one of the, one of the things about like, if you're not used to eating green beans, say, (laughs) or a a steak, it might just taste like really weird and waxy or like so rich and overpowering. Um, But I think one way to approach the book, this book could be, uh, as to offer kind of like samplings of different cuisines, as it were, from uh, the history of cinema. So one film, for example, that was a great discovery for me in reviewing all the, uh, you know, going through the, the list. And just to say, it's, this isn't just my book, I have two co-authors as well. So you'll find um, essays both from me and uh, Andrew Pettiprin and Father Michael Ward as well in uh, between the covers. But one uh, movie that was a great discovery for me was this one I'd never heard of which is called The Tree of Wooden Clogs. And the setup sounds constantly boring, maybe. It's basically just following around this little village of 19th century Italian peasants as they go through their rural day, planting in the field, slaughtering a goose, taking tomatoes into town to sell them. I mean, it doesn't sound like anything that we associate with, like, you know, superhero movies, what what we're used to uh, at the cinema. But like you suggested before, um, it's it's a movie for me that has like sort of changed my life, changed my perspective. And the way it did that, I think, is it brought just such a profound sense of the dignity and even, I would say, like the holiness of human life um, in the context of this otherwise unnoticeable set of people. So I couldn't agree more that there's there's a whole other way to approach cinema. Um, and hopefully this book could be helpful for some people to maybe uh, bridge that gap. You know, it's funny because um, we're talking about this and, and the Pope himself, actually, I'm pretty sure has said he hasn't watched TV in like decades. <laughs> kind of a funny hmm. um, irony. And, you know, I'm sure he would in no way, I, I'm sure he would 
if he had seen these movies or he's probably seen many of these movies would say, you know, that they're wonderful, but, um, you know, it's just kind of a funny irony. And so, you know, what, what would you say to, you know, how would you answer the question, you know, why should, why should Catholics care about, about film? Um, you know, when we have a Pope who doesn't even, hasn't even watched a television in, in two decades. <laughs> One thing is worth mentioning, like the film that you mentioned, Babette's Feast, actually, I think Pope Francis mentions it in one of his uh, encyclicals or uh, papal exhortations with approval. So that's one thing. You're, and you're right that, you know, that film came out 30 plus years ago. Um, but to your question of like, why should we engage you? Oh, I think there are about 100 reasons <laughs> off the top of my head. One, it's enjoyable. Two, other people are doing it, which isn't <laughs> in itself a reason to do it. But it can be a bridge to engage with other people. You know, how often you have a friend or a family member or a colleague and you have something like a water cooler conversation about the most recent news item or movie that came out. This is another way to connect with people and maybe uh, in a more substantial way. If you've seen some of these, I'd say more like extraordinary off the beaten path sort of films. Um, and also, I think for the reason that, that you mentioned, which is they can really enrich our lives. Why should we ever go to an art museum? Why should we ever listen to a symphony? Why should we ever read um, a novel that came out before 1900 or read poetry? Well, because the arts, when they're done well, just, as you said so well before, can like really open up new horizons and give us a deeper appreciation of what it means to be human uh, living in this world as we do and even i think say like living in the presence of god for catholics uh, who are who take their faith seriously and other christians and, and I'm, I'm sure other denominations of uh, believers going to the movies or watching a movie you haven't read about or haven't looked up can be sort of scary right because mm. you don't know what's going to surprise you and and you don't and i don't want to sound prudish but Years ago, I decided, and, I, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners decided this too at some point in their lives, that, you know, you only have so much time and you, and you want to use it wisely and you want to elevate the tone of your mind when, mm. when you're consuming entertainment. So I think a list like this, well, first of all, I think, I think the list and the book are incredibly useful, especially in this time of streaming where you can look up any movie. I was the other day, I don't know if this book, maybe you can tell me if this book is on the list. There's, um, so recently I wanted to watch, uh, I, wa I was wondering if there was uh, a movie version of Under the Sun of Satan by George Bernano, the novel, uh, the novelist, the French novelist. And there is, and it turns out to be an amazing movie. And you, you can Google it and you can find it and you can stream mm. it. So how wonderful to have a comprehensive guide. I'm sorry that it stops in 1995. <laughs> yes. I think there's been so many wonderful movies that that have come out since then that can have that could have a tremendous impact on on on, a, on an open mind and an open heart. Um, I think it's also probably a great gift to give to people who you know consume a lot of a lot of entertainment, and you know to help them maybe look beyond the more that, that more superficial fare and go somewhere deeper. What can you tell us um, some of your favorites on the list? You personally? Uh, yes. So I love the movies I've already mentioned um, on the waterfront, Gandhi, uh, Tree of Living Clogs. Um, there are great films on there that I never get tired of watching. Like, Citizen Kane, <laughs> Babette's Feast, the one you mentioned, great. Uh, the Mission, really beautiful movie. Um, I could probably just go on and on, but I don't want to just name all the <laughs> movies on the list, but those are some ones that I, that I think are really great. And what are the essays? Are the essays straight up and down reviews, or are they more, I don't know, do they tend to a, a different focus? So what each chapter does is gives a, like a one-sentence synopsis so people can know what they're <laughs> getting into. And then offers a maybe five or six page essay um, that uh, is meant to be a kind of ramp up to the film. So like we've already alluded to in our conversation, a lot of these are films that people won't have heard of before, either because they are just old or were produced in another part of the world uh, or are more artsy um, than 
many people are used to encountering. And so a, a major purpose that, of, of the book that, that we tried to do in each essay was where the films are difficult or obscure or unfamiliar to contextualize these things so that readers can come to watch them with uh, more appreciation. So there are a few spoilers sprinkled here and there, but mostly the point is to help readers um, get into and to appreciate the sometimes subtle cinematic and artistic things that are going on in these different films. And finally, to uh, help readers to reflect theologically on these films so that, like you say, don't come away just sort of, um, well, not feeling, you know, kind of morally gross or even coming away kind of blank, but doing something constructive uh, for our faith lives and just human lives uh, coming away from the book. So each chapter has some theological content, but then uh, offers like a few reflection questions at the end as well, which could be great in the family context amongst friends or even in some kind of like film club. Well, I'm ordering my copy right away. And I have, <laughs> and I think I'm going to order a couple more copies for friends of mine. Um, one of my sons who's married, I know that he and his wife like to watch movies and I think it would be wonderful for them to delve deeper into to the rich history of movies and the way movies can be so deeply satisfying and ennobling. So the book is called Popcorn with the Pope, and you can uh, buy it at wordonfire.org. And our guest is David Paul Baird, who is an award-winning film critic and the main author on that book. Thank you so much for joining us today, David. It was a great pleasure. Great. Thank you. Yeah, it was for me too. Thank you so much. Every morning, the Catholic Association reviews all the latest news and sends our subscribers a carefully curated collection of the most important news of the day. Items are specifically selected for a smart Catholic audience like you. Don't let the world take you by surprise. Subscribe to our daily media roundup at thecatholicassociation.org. Joining us now is Alejandro Monteverde, distinguished movie producer and director of the most recent box office smash success, which I'm sure all of us have seen, Sound of Freedom. He also directed Bella and other pro-life films. Bella is one of my favorites. There's a new film uh, of his that's coming out called Cabrini. It'll be out in theaters on March 8th, which happens to be International Women's Day, and it tells the story of Mother Cabrini who is the very first American saint. Welcome to the show, Alejandro. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, I was very happy last night sitting on my couch and uh, watching the beautiful film Cabrini that you just uh, produ that you just directed that is going to be aired on International Women's Day, which is March 8th. And Maureen, my co-hostess, saw it last summer, and she and I both very, very much enjoyed it. And I think it's a wonderful addition to a great canon of films from you, Alejandro. So thank you for making it. And, and tell us what inspired you and what led you to the wonderful Saint Cabrini. Well, I, I was just honored that, you know, this project came knocking on my door. I personally did not know who Cabrini was. I had uh, no knowledge of all her achievements or anything. I, 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 I knew nothing of her. Mm -hmm. And I was very surprised to not have known some nothing about somebody so powerful. Mm -hmm. And when I mean powerful is somebody who used all of her given talents, God given talents to, you know, live for others and, and change, you know, the world for those Uh, they had no dignity and, and for the children that were living on the streets and the children of the immigrant. So uh, she was a revolutionary and I didn't know anything about her. So I, I, I got a phone call one day and, and from uh, Eustace Wolfington, who is not only my mentor, but he had a big devotion to her. And um, just literally it was out of the blue. I got a phone call and she asked me if I would read the screenplay. And my first instinct was I'll read it, but definitely this is not for me. I had a little prejudice because, you know, I wanted to make a movie and movies supposed to be very entertaining. And I just couldn't see how the life of, in this case, a nun could be cinematic in, in a way that could be entertaining. You know, a lot of times you do documentaries about characters like this, 
it's very hard to do a very entertaining film. To my surprise, when I read the script, I realized that her life was extremely entertaining. Mm -hmm. And she was a revolutionary in many, many ways. And I, she, her life shone a light in the world. So I, I saw an opportunity to shine a cinematic light in her life. So that's how it all began. And, you know, I was mesmerized by her story. I, I certainly was, too. And I'm wondering, could you flesh this out a little bit for our listeners? Because she's, as you said, she's the type of saint that we've heard of. But as you said, we most of us don't know too much about her. And one of the things that struck me so much is that she was this physically tiny, weak woman. She had ill health. She was born prematurely, poor health her entire life. She was actually rejected by the first group of sisters that she tried, tried to join. She had to go out and found her own order. But I think you're right that there is so much drama in the movie because she demonstrates <coughs> such resilience and perseverance and determination. And even though she's this tiny little person, she became such a giant of the church. Yeah. I mean, this is the ultimate underdog story in many ways. You know, it's 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 rocky. It, she came here with nothing as a woman in a time where women had no voice. She was one of the first women to lead an overseas mission just led by women. Uh, into a country that was not very welcoming to Italians. And she was able to defy all odds. She was able to build an empire as big as the Rockefellers, but her empire was not an empire for enrichers, for enriching herself. It was an empire to help others, especially those living on the streets, especially children and the sick and those without dignity. And she came in with nothing as an immigrant and was able to, you know, build so many institutions and fight all the way from people from the street, like in this case, a pimp, all the way to the highest political places like the mayor of New York in order to achieve and give a voice to those that had no voice. So that in itself has a lot of drama and conflict she was a fighter and her ultimate fight is like you said, she was fighting death itself. The doctors were giving her one to two years to live and she was able to squeeze, you know, many, many decades. She died until she was uh, on her late sixties. So, you know, it's just kind of movie. She says a line in the film that it spoke to me very directly. And I think it speaks to many people is you can serve your weakness or you can serve your purpose. Mm -hmm. Alejandro, and we, we have all a, have weaknesses and purpose. Alejandro, I have a, an, a list of notes here to talk to you. And right across the top, it says you can serve your weaknesses or you can serve your purpose. Because I, I brought that line away with me from the movie. And I almost want to engrave it on, on my, my mirror where I brush my teeth. Because so often we are overwhelmed by the thought of our, our frailties and the, the things that we just can't get right. Or we think we never be, will be able to get right. And what a wonderful example. Right of uh, of a person who whose single minded um, devotion to a beautiful project is yeah. able is able to conquer all those own weaknesses and the weaknesses that weren't just hers right the weaknesses of being female the weaknesses of being an immigrant and the wrong kind of immigrant um, you know watching the movie last night as I saw it last night I was very much there's a whole there's a whole line running through the movie about being an immigrant and what that means in a country like the United States. You're an immigrant. I I I came here at the age of 11 from Mexico myself and it's it's we live in an amazing country, the United States. It's it's the only country I can I have ever heard of where everyone's from somewhere else, right? If either either you or your parents or you go back a couple of generations and so we have this rich fascinating land and yet every immigrant experience has these um, these hard obstacles, right? That we have to that we have to get over, and in Cabrini's uh, in this wonderful saint's case was the prejudice against Italians, even by the more recent the immigrants right before them, which were the Irish. Was it was it really interesting to you to delve into that that complication of being an immigrant in the United States in this film? Yes, but, you know, you said it. This is a very powerful and beautiful country. So if you think, yes, there was a lot of discrimination against Italians, but there's a line in the film that I love. It says, one day somebody will be in this office and he won't be cleaning it. And we already had a mayor, many, a couple of different mayors that were from Italy, exactly. uh, mayors of New York. 
So it shows you how an immigrant can come here and become a major, yeah. uh, you know, if you're from a uh, descendant. So it is a country that even though it sounds like a cliche, it is a land of opportunity. And the film explores that because Cabrini came with nothing. And at the end, she built this one of the top hospitals of New York. So it, it is also reflects and, 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 and celebrates um, all the, you know, opportunities that this country has to offer, even though you have to go to challenges, but like these are obstacles that, can actually be defeated, you know, unfortunately, you can't say that about, about other countries. You know, the, the, the obstacles are impossible to get, to, to overcome. And in this case, it, it, it explores that. Even though there was all this, you know, resistance against, you know, the Italians uh, before it was the, the, um, the Irish and, you know, after Italians, you know, were many different Asians and then obviously uh, 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 Mexicans. And it was, it's just been a, um, it, it is part in many ways has become part of the process, but I identify with, with the film a lot because I came here not, in, not even speaking English. Mm-hmm. with really bad grades and you know uh, i was able to to you know get get into the university get my grades get into film school and you know the the the, the doors continue to open and the opportunities continue to open and i i i'm very grateful to to the my immigrant story and I identify with 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 i think that's what the, the, what is so interesting about this this film is that this movie is not about immigration. It's, it's this movie is about the immigrant, which mm-hmm. is very different. That's a, a great distinction there. And um, my father grew up in an area of New York City, an enclave of Irish immigrants, and it happens to be right near Mother Cabrini Park. So I know her legacy runs very powerfully, especially in that area of the city where she founded these hospitals and schools and orphanages, I think 67 in all, not just in New York City, but all across the United States and really all across the world. Something that was very touching to me was the story from her childhood when she seemed to first have a sense of her vocation. There's this story of her placing little flowers and paper boats, violets, and dropping them in a stream and imagining that they carried her off to be a missionary in China. And when she went to the Pope, she asked to be sent to China, apparently, but he had a different answer and a different plan for her. But but this story also sheds light on why her name is St. Francis Xavier Cabrini. Could you share that story with us? Yeah, I mean, what was very interesting is, um, you know, the, the writer of the film Rod Bar, he did a lot of research. I mean, I think he read every single book there is about her, but also he went to Lombardy. He traveled all around Italy, getting to know, reading documents that were not public, like the Senate that was not public. That's something that, you know, he found by diving really deep into the depths of, of her life. You know, for me, my job was just to kind of create a cinematic experience of her life. She lived her life very artfully. And I wanted to depict her life in the most artistic and most cinematic way. So the film, when you finish, it leaves you in a state of reflection that inspires you in whatever, you know, battle you're facing. This is one thing that we've been seeing with with audiences. You know, the movie speaks to everybody in a very personal way. And You know, I can share many, many stories of different people that are facing different kind of battles. You know, I have had friends that, you know, going through very difficult times in their marriage and they saw Cabrini and they're like, well, if she was able to fight for and and accomplish all of that, maybe we give another shot to to, to their, their given situation. Same thing with people that are struggling with any kind of things. So it is a very inspirational film, uh, uh, you know, that it's it's just I, I like to make movies that begin when the movie ends. You know, when the movie ends, it leaves you in a state of reflection and you start questioning yourself about, you know, more profound and meaningful questions. And for me, I uh, there was a movie that I saw when I was in film school with Schindler's List, with, you know, Schindler himself was a Catholic and he 
rescue thousands and thousands of, of Jewish lives. And at the end of the film, he looks at his car and he says, you know, I could have sold my car and saved one, one more. And I remember leaving the theater and walking home and realizing that the film had put a deeper question in my life. Well, what am I doing for others? Besides every, all the plans was me, me and me. You know, I wanted to make movies just because I love movies. And I remember leaving the theater and saying, that's the kind of cinema I want to make. And when I read The Life of Cabrini and her fight and also in many ways her surrender she wanted to go to china there was different plans you know there's a saying you want to make god laugh tell him your plans <laughs> she said her plans and the plans was to start in new york and you know that whole odyssey it's a journey it was a, a very very cinematic journey in her life and i was just honored to be able to capture it well you've succeeded our audience can go to angel.com forward slash tickets or forward slash cabrini and go ahead and buy tickets. So thank you so much, Alejandro. Thank you. Dear friends, I published this in The Catholic Thing, which many of you may follow, as so many Catholics do. It's a wonderful website with, I think, beautiful writers and, and, and lovely truths about our faith. I don't count myself in the beautiful writer category, but I wanted, you to, I wanted to share with you a piece I wrote called The Severe Truth of Lent on February 16th, 2024. As Lent begins again and with and with it the desire to follow Christ on the way to Calvary. I am fascinated, as all Western civilization has been for two millennia, by the cross at the end of that uphill climb. It is the meeting point of all the things we dread, and perhaps the greatest mystery of all time is that God hung himself on it. Over the years I've contemplated in turns, his physical torment, the loneliness of his desolation, the way he watched his mother watch him die. This Lent, a whole new avenue of prayer has been opened for me in St. John Henry Newman's Meditations on the Mental Suffering of Christ. In a Victorian torrent of words, Newman has made me conscious for the first time of something I find utterly shocking, the reality of God's taking on of sin, the mortal enemy of his very nature. Since my childhood, I have ritually asked for mercy from the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. When I have done so, I think I usually have imagined a neat bundle of sins like dried sticks, tied to the back of a lamb, wandering, bleeding into the desert. The lamb is snow white, pure and clean as only a lamb can be. The bundle on her back may bow her spine with its weight, but it doesn't stain her. It rests cleanly on her. It's a pretty picture, but childish. Newman's 1852 sermon, Mental Sufferings of Our Lord and His Passion, presents a terrible prospect to those who love Jesus that his bodily suffering was as nothing compared to the intolerable pain in his soul, and that this soul agony results not from the heaviness of sin, but from the fact of its being an invasion, voluntarily accepted. Far from simply carrying sin away, he opens his mortal nature to the attack of the evil one and lets the enemy's foul deeds infiltrate and permeate him. Newman's incomparable prose captures this facet of Christ's passion. There, then, in that most awful hour, knelt the Savior of the world, bearing his breast, sinless as he was, to the assault of his foe, of a foe whose breath was a pestilence and whose embrace was an agony. There he knelt, motionless and still, while the vile and horrible fiend clad his spirit in a robe steeped in all that is hateful and heinous in human crime, which clung close around his heart and filled his conscience and found its way into every sense and pore of his mind and spread over him a moral leprosy, till he almost felt himself to be that which he never could be, and which his foe would fain have made him. Newman goes on to describe the eternal purity, feeling like a foul and loathsome sinner stung by every drop of that mass of corruption which poured over his head, of the experience of Jesus looking at his hands and seeing them drenched in the blood of millions of history's innocents seeing through eyes profaned by evil visions and idolatrous fascinations, his lips defiled by oaths and blasphemies. Every vile sin committed before that day and since has homed in on him, is on him, and in him, their reek driving away the ineffable peace which has inhabited his soul since the moment of his conception. No wonder that during the agony in the garden, before the first Roman lash had struck him, the blood broke through his burning veins and out the pores of his skin, beating his whole body and soaking his mantle. Though it is hard to think of, or to bear for very long, we must look at this image of the immensity of God's mercy. You and I, we sin, but we barely notice it. We are comfortable with our sinfulness. It has been on us and in us since we were formed. But the pure one writhed under an alien agony, as though he were the criminal. 
Yet Jesus goes further. As Newman observes, his suffering even takes the form of guilt and compunction. He is doing penance. He is making confession. He is exercising contrition. For he is the one victim for us all, the sole satisfaction, the real penitent, all but the real sinner. Newman reminds us that Jesus does not allow himself to die until he has drained the cup, until full atonement has been made for my sins and yours and those of every child of Eve whose deeds have covered our race with shame. It takes real Lenten courage to contemplate the furthest sadness, God's death. My own courage often fails me at far less painful sights. But Christ died, St. John Henry Newman tells us, not of bodily exhaustion or of bodily pain. No, having sipped the last drop, he willed his tormented heart to break. And only then did he commend his spirit to his Father. A severe truth to keep before us these 40 days. And now Father Roger Landry offers a short and inspiring homily for this Sunday's Gospel. This is Father Roger Landry, and it's a privilege to join you again as we ponder together the consequential conversation Jesus wants to have with us in the Gospel this Sunday, the fourth Sunday of Lent, which the Church calls Laetare Sunday, a title taken from the first word in Latin of the entrance antiphon for this Sunday's Mass, Laetare Jerusalem. Rejoice, Jerusalem, and all who love her. Be joyful, all who are mourning. Exult and be satisfied at her consoling breast. These words of consolation, originally given by the prophet Isaiah to the exiled Jews in Babylon, are just a small sign of the far greater liberation and joy that Jesus was going to bring into the world. A liberation from the exile and alienation caused by sin. A freedom from the captivity to which sin leads. Death. That's a message that's supposed to make not just Jerusalem rejoice during this time of ongoing turmoil in the Holy Land, but also New York, Washington, Miami, L.A., Rome, Paris, and indeed every city, town, village, and place. That joy is because of the unfathomable love of God that would stop at nothing to redeem us. The church has us ponder that love in the gospel this Sunday when St. John tells us, God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. The evangelist adds, God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, to render us strict justice on account of our sins, but so that the world might be saved through him. While the human race was in a far worse situation than the ancient Jews in Babylon, God himself sent someone greater than the king of Persia to set us free. He sent his own son. When God the Father had a choice to allow us to die in eternal exile, or allow his son to take our place on death row and be brutally mocked and crucified, he loved us in some sense even more than his son. He chose to save our life by allowing his son to give his. This indescribable love is an incredible cause for joy. This love of God that would pull out all the stops in order to save us is the root of all Christian joy. But it's important for us not to hear this message in a softened and sentimentalized way. It's great that so many plaster John 3.16 on football stadiums around the country, proclaiming our joy that God loves the world and us so much. But at the same time, sometimes many don't see the contradiction when during those same football games, some players stomp on their adversaries with their cleats and curse and huddles. And as huge numbers of fans are getting plastered in the stands, watching scantily clad cheerleaders stoke their concupiscence like Herod and Tipas and his drunken courtiers watch Salome dance. For us to enter into the joy that comes from Christ's love, we need to grasp what it cost and what a response that love demands. Jesus describes that cost in his conversation with Nicodemus in the Gospel passage. For those of you who have watched the crowdfunded television series, The Chosen, you know that much has been made in the first season of Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus, not only as a member of the Sanhedrin, but also a searcher for the truth. In the Gospel passage, Jesus challenges Nicodemus to open his mind to the truth he came into the world to bring. Jesus tells Nicodemus first about the need for baptism. Then he states in biblical language what he would do on the cross to make baptism effect what it signifies. Jesus tells us in this Sunday's passage, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him might have eternal life. That was an allusion first to the work of the ancient serpent, who got Adam and Eve in the garden to distrust God, to sin, and essentially to choose death over life. 
But then the allusion pointed to what God had allowed to happen to the Jews in the desert as they were complaining about what they had to eat and distrusting anew in the one with, who with multiple miracles had saved them from Pharaoh. The book of Numbers describes God allowed Sarah serpents to slither among them and bite them with poisonous venom. The antidote God prescribed to save them was to have Moses make a bronze serpent and mount it on a staff. And those who looked on that serpent, a reminder of the sins that had infected them with a fatally, fatal bodily and spiritual venom, they would be saved. Jesus said that he on the cross would become like that elevated bronze serpent. He would suck the poison of sin out of our wounds and take it with him to Calvary. As we sinners looked at him on the cross, we would see first just what our sins had done. Second, we would grasp that we can't save ourselves from our sins by our own efforts. And third, we would behold the great love of God who would take on those sins and the death to which they inexorably lead in order to provide us the saving antitoxin. But the type of glance we need to give to Jesus lifted up on the cross must not remain merely a thing of the lenses and the visual cortex. To be saved, we need to look with the eyes of faith, a faith that has to become a way of life. That's what St. John express, expresses immediately after the consoling words about the depth of God's love. Whoever believes in Jesus, he tells us, will not be condemned, but whoever does not believe has already been condemned. He forcefully reminds us that just like those in Jerusalem prior to the exile refused to listen to the prophets, so we can refuse to listen to Jesus, to look upon him with the eyes of grateful faith, and to receive his free gift of salvation. This is the verdict, St. John states, that the light came into the world but people preferred darkness to light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, but whoever lives the truth comes to the light so that his works may be clearly seen as done in God. To look on Jesus lifted up on the cross with the eyes of faith means to enter into the logic of the cross. It means to heed Jesus' words we hear every Lent, to deny ourselves, pick up our cross each day and follow him, leaving the darkness of sin behind and entering with him into the fullness of light. Like St. John, we must behold the one we have pierced and see the saving transformative blood and water flowing from his side. Like St. Paul, we need to look at Christ on the cross in a way that leads us to become one with his saving love. I've been crucified with Christ, St. Paul would write to the Galatians. And it is no longer even I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. That's why St. Paul was able to glory and boast in nothing, he said, except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world is crucified to me and I to the world. That's why when Jews found the cross a scandal, as we heard last Sunday, a scandal that the Messiah would be murdered by the very occupying forces from whose clutches they anticipated he would liberate them. And for the Greeks a folly, that someone would be so dumb as to be publicly tortured and ignominiously executed. St. Paul was able to find in the cross his power and glory. He found in the cross the source of the healing we most need. What Jesus explained in Nicodemus in the gospel and fulfilled on Golgotha takes on special meaning at Mass. It's at Mass that we behold Jesus lifted up, not as a bronze serpent on a pole, but as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, elevated by the hands of his priests. It's at Mass that we encounter the awesome truth that God so loved the world so much that not only did he give his son in Palestine 2,000 years ago, but shows that love even more by giving us his son daily on the altar and making his son's forgiveness available to us in many places every day in the sacrament of penance. As we prepare for Mass, let's get ready to look on Christ lifted high on the cross, lifted up in the host, and say with St. John, and all the members of the church. We have come to know and to believe in the love God has for us. We have indeed come to trust in him and in his saving mercy. We've come to believe in his light and to desire to live in the light of his truth so that all our works and indeed our whole life may be clearly seen as lived in God. So, Laetare, Jerusalem. Indeed, rejoice, Jerusalem. Rejoice, O world. Rejoice, listeners, to conversations with consequences. God's merciful love is real, and God loves us so much that he never ceases to share that gift with us so that we might not perish but have life with him forever. God bless you. With that, I leave you, and thank you again for being our listeners, and we continue to pray for you always. Always.